All right. Um, tend to give it a couple of seconds because everybody's getting notifications and they're signing in right now. Um, yeah. So. <clears throat> I'm going to share it right here if I can. Yeah, yeah, we can do that. Mm -mm, mm -mm. I probably can't do anything. There it is. And I can trim off the the uh, the kind of chill wait period um, from Facebook later on, yeah, so it's more interesting. Oh, we got people coming in here. I don't know who it is. Oh, more people. All right, cool. So um, since we got people joining us, uh, essentially this is Nomad Explorations. If you are familiar, uh, the television show on Smithsonian for Hunt for Eagle Fifty Six. Um, and uh, just out of New Hampshire, a couple of guys that are doing, well, a bunch of guys that are in New Hampshire and New England in general, uh, a bunch of guys doing some different uh, exploration type stuff. So we're going to talk about what they went through, what they found, some general stories, and then um, tips and tricks for maybe uh, getting through. I mean, these are technical dives, but just general scuba and technical dives. So uh, welcome, guys. Uh, go ahead and introduce yourselves really quick, if you would, for me. Listen, thank you. Thanks for having us. My name is Jeff Goodrow. Um, I am a resident of the state of New Hampshire, southwestern New Hampshire, over by Torres of Vermont border. Uh, avid wreck diver, CCR diver, um, helium, and wreck diving is my game. Nate? Hi, I'm Nate. I live in Vermont. Um, I've been diving 26 years, and I've probably huffed enough helium to float a Goodyear blimp at this point. So Nice. I don't know. That's what I'm into. Good. Do you oh. make beer runs, Nate? Can you bring beer from Vermont out here? I can. Next time you come, yeah. <laughs> I like one of my guys. Like, yes, like, 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 like. We will bring beer out your way. <laughs> come and get it. Um, what do you want? Like a heady topper? Or something? Yeah, sure. Whatever you got from Vermont, any IPA, the guys will drink it. On your way to the to okay. St. Lawrence, drop it off. I'm down. Uh, hopefully, you guys you come up it. this summer to do that. So that'd be great. Um, can you guys just? Um, Give us a kind of a rundown of what the Eagle 56 is for the guys that don't, or for people that don't really know what we're talking about when we when we say that. Sure. So uh, Eagle 56 was a World War One era Navy patrol vessel sub chaser. Uh, she was one of eight that survived to World War Two and was in service through the entire war uh, World War Two. She rescued the um, uh, stationed off Cape Cape May. She she rescued the. I got to get my history correct because I know somebody will jump on me. Um, <laughs> she rescued the crew of the Jacob Jones, which I believe was actually the first U.S. warship lost in U.S. waters, only to become at the end of the war, she was the last U.S. warship lost in U.S. waters in the Atlantic. Yeah. So, um, and uh, kind of became famous at, at that, at that title alone. However, with the sinking, it, uh, the ship had exploded in April, just two weeks before the end of the war. Navy short story is the Navy declared it a boiler explosion through the efforts of, uh, you know, so by declaring it a boiler explosion, it was not a, a, an act of war. And none of the uh, 49 crew that were killed in the incident uh, were given uh, Purple Hearts, issued Purple Hearts. And they basically, several crew in the engineering particularly, um, kind of went to their graves thinking uh, they were guilty. Hmm. of killing their friends, you know. So um, through uh, the work of Paul Lawton in the uh, very, very early 2000s, late 90s, uh, he was able to, um, through research and whatnot, track it back to not a boiler explosion, but a, um, uh, a torpedo from the U-853, uh, the sub that's lost off Rhode Island. Gotcha. So... Uh, the Navy knew U-853 was operating in the area um, the day of the explosion as guys were abandoning ship. Some of the uh, uh, sailors said they saw the conning tower of a sub, had a red horse and a yellow field on the, painted on the conning tower. And that was some of the evidence right there from the Port of Inquiry that uh, put it back to the U-853. Uh, so the Navy officially recognized in the early 2000s that it was, in fact, a war kill, making the sailors eligible for um purple hearts where we come into it is that the ship had never been found you know it, 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 the coast of maine is very different than the coast of new jersey new york that area down there where it's just you know like a volleyball court of sand 
it's just all rocks and uh, huge, huge, huge rock outcrops. I mean, 150, 200 feet high in spots. <clears throat> and um, the eagle really disappeared, truly disappeared. Everybody, you know, many people saw the explosion. Navy ship saw the explosion. And um, um, unfortunately, she, she just disappeared. Um, for that many people to witness it, it was kind of the other way around from a normal shipwreck sinking where nobody saw it, nobody knew where it was. They just put in a radio call, hey, we're in trouble. That's that. And they're gone. Uh, Eagle, on the other hand, a million people, a thousand people saw it, but yet when people went looking for it, she was nowhere to be found. So there was always question as to whether the Navy was off, whether the Navy was covering something up um, or whatnot. But the decision to change um, change the findings to a torpedo attack was academic. Okay, it was done on this sub was in this area at this time and, and whatnot and put together like that. There was no hard facts. Um, fortunately enough, when we found the ship, um, and a team of us, the Nomad crew, Paul Lott and Gary Kozak, um, and, and others that had come along too. You know, there was a bunch of people involved in this. It wasn't just us by any means. Um, we were able to ultimately um, confirm by finding the boilers that uh, it was in fact a torpedo that killed you know 49 American sailors at the end of the war. So. I think I got it all in there. Yeah, that works. <laughs> Enough of it, anyway. <laughs> Enough of it. Yep. Um, and you guys end up being Nate. Were you, you were involved in all this too? I, I think that kind of was left out. Well, I, I got into it kind of later. Um, Jeff, Danny, and Ryan had been looking for it for some time, and um, they just kind of brought us into it. So they had started the initial searches, and then. The year that it was discovered, uh, my friend Josh and I had been asked to join the Nomad team and started diving and stuff. So we got into it a little later than they did. Yeah. We, we were fortunate enough to be a part of the team and uh, were part of them when, when the discovery was made. So it was uh, quite an experience for me, you know, being, being that I've been wreck diving as long as I have and to be involved in something this big was, uh, it was great. So. Yeah. So that brings a question that, that I, I get periodically and it's, um, it's and it's a very open-ended question and open-ended answers um how do you get in, to be involved in one of these teams like it's like how how and did that, you that's on get... craigslist casual encounters oh yeah yeah and exactly. it just kind of blossomed from there so. <laughs> in the free yeah, is coming. it the free section <laughs> yeah and you'll learn very fast very fast to, uh ask questions very carefully <laughs> <laughs> i love it well, I was very fortunate, Josh and I, um, you know, we we're all very like-minded. Like, we've taken long trips together, and we all click. We've, there's no arguing. There's no whining. There's no, you know, we don't leave the trip and go, oh, God, that guy drives me batty. Yeah. We all just get along so well. We're all from different walks of life. I work with uh, propane for a living, and I, and I teach scuba. Jeff drives a meat truck. Ryan's a school teacher. I mean, it just, we're all different. So this you know? is kind of king of the hill of wreck diving. We have the same passion. What's that? I said, this is kind of king of the hill of wreck diving. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Jason, we propane actually, and propane accessories. Yeah. <laughs> we actually say that stuff about Nate when he leaves. So. <laughs> okay, fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> yeah, I guess if there's nobody on the team that I talk bad about, I'm the guy. Right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, seriously, we, we do uh, we do wreck diving. We do cool stuff, and Nate's not kidding. We take, uh, back in 17, we took uh, Ryan's boat. We put it on the back of his truck, a 27-foot, you know, eight, 9,000-pound boat, all of our gear, and we headed uh, west out to the Great Lakes. We started, we drove from New Hampshire here up to uh, the Alpena area, drove Lake Huron for a week, and then drove another 600 miles north of there, all the way up to the very top of Lake Superior to the Ganilda, and drove there for a week, and then worked our way home, you know, 36-hour ride home. So that was... Uh, Two weeks and some change, I think, 3,300 miles of driving. Yeah. Plus all that time on the boat, and we shared a house or, or, you know, kind of group accommodations the entire time, and there wasn't a single flight, not a single quorum. Um, they're a hell of a good group of guys. Good. Yeah, essentially that's my answer to most people. It's like, uh, you kind of got to get involved and just kind of prove your worth without overstepping your bounds at the same time, and it just will fall into your lap, but that's very hard for people to – <laughs> grasp <laughs> we've all been we've all been friends for some of us for you know a long time you know yeah. 15 years or more you know 20 years um it, it just kind of 
you know, you, you need enough guys to go diving. That's our that's yeah. our whole thing is we need enough guys to fill the seats on the boat to go diving. It's not a charter boat, it's a private boat, you know, yeah. and uh, we're just doing this for fun and you want to be out with guys you like. So uh, naturally, it, when it came time to bring more guys in, you, you, you go to your friends, yep. you know, so. Exactly. Yeah, people you've been diving with. Boat. Yeah. Yeah. Um, funding, is it externally funding? Was Sony involved at all? Was that an afterthought? Is uh, What's going on with that if you that don't mind all, answering? That was all an afterthought. We've done all of this. Um, we do it all out of pocket. Like I said, yeah. we go for fun. So uh, looking for the wreck, we it, we spent uh, four years roughly looking for the wreck off the top of my head. Um, we paid all the gas, you know, just kind of yeah. everybody chips in at the end of the day. Whether you find something you don't, you dive targets, we build a lot of rocks. We looked yeah. at a lot of rocks, you know what I mean? Yeah. Lots of rock diving. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, we, the TV crew kind of came in. We had already found. Well, <laughs> spoiler alert. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we had already found the bow section of the wreck. But where Smithsonian and Lone Wolf, Lone Wolf was great. Um, they were, if you're gonna work with uh, for a diving production, they were really good to work with. They've done a lot, a lot of diving shows. What I liked most about them, they're local. They were easy to work with. But yeah. Um, when we, we explained to them first time we sat down, and Paul Lawton was the one that uh, pointed it to us, along with several other friends who worked with him. Um, <clears throat> first meeting, we said, listen, this isn't, you know, uh, bearing sea gold where you're in 10 feet of water. Or mm -hmm. You know, it was, it was uh, this is, you know, almost 300 foot deep yeah. and 10 feet of visibility in 38 degree water, you know. So, I mean, this real deal diving, so we will do whatever you want on the boat. Uh, we'll say whatever you want. Well, no, we didn't actually, but you know, <laughs> whatever you need us to do, we'll do. But when yeah. the doctor comes out, that's it. Back off. And they, every time they came out with us, um, they the, the first rebreather would get broken out, the first dry suit, and they would like disappear. The, the producer would go sit up on the bow, the cameraman would just kind of blend into the background, and they would leave you alone and let you just do the diving. You know, uh, they, that... they go, I, I'm biased, but I mean, the show, I think. Um, very much reflected what it's like diving up here and that none of that crap was you know made up that was they so we had um so i'm sorry i jumped ahead of myself so we had found the bow and we went to lone wolf and of course we didn't have the rest of the wreck so they were they were uh uh trying to market it out to networks you know which we had a lot of networks interested in it but um it was a big story to tell but the big problem was we didn't have the rest of the wreck right yeah. you know um so <laughs> So they signed on, uh, Lone Wolf and then Smithsonian Channel signed on. So they did what they filmed what they call like a sizzle reel. It's like a two minute, you know, yep. this, is, this is basically what's coming on. They show it to network people and network people say, yeah, that's good for our network. That's not good for our network. Yep. Um, we had, uh, I don't know, several networks interested, but Smithsonian came forward and said, we love the story. We love what they're doing. We love that they're regular guys just doing this on their own. Um, we'll give them whatever they need for time. Because time is always the big thing on a TV show. I, I learned that. And I'm a first at this. I knew nothing about all this stuff. So um, you, you could have gone to a Discovery Channel or something like that, which would have been really cool. We would have gotten a one hour. And you try and tell a story this big, this encompassing, that yep. you know, a story that covers 70 years in one hour, it's impossible. You know, We wanted to do, do justice for the guys, for the crew uh, on, on, of that ship. Um, and uh, Smithsonian Channel said, whatever you guys need, one hour, three hours, four hours, whatever you need, take it, film it, and, and that's that. So they stuck with us while we continued hunting the ship. So that we had the camera crews out there while we were finding this stuff, while we were finding the stern, while we were finding the boilers. Um, you know, it, it, and it was kind of, it gave like a neat, I think it gave a neat aspect to the show because it was legit. I mean, <laughs> these guys surfaced from the dives, you know, Danny... And Ryan surfaced from the boiler dive. You know, I don't know if you've seen the show, but they surfaced yeah, from the I boiler have. dive. Yep. Uh, that was legit. I yeah. mean, <laughs> that, was, that was the day. That's how it happened right there. So you can't make that stuff up. Nope. And I think it really came forward in that. So um, Smithsonian was really good in that sense as far as giving us leeway. It took us a year. It took us a year from, just shy of a year from when we found the bow to when we found the boilers. Wow. So it stuck with us for an entire year. Yeah. It's and the the fact that they're cooperating as much or cooperating to let you do your thing is is amazing. I've done some stuff. We did some stuff with hunts diving and on a television commercial type thing, and it was interesting at best. Working with some underwater film crew type stuff, so <laughs> um, it was interesting. But uh, so we're referring to when we've been talking about this is uh, show was uh, on Smithsonian, and now it's actually streaming. Um, 
And actually, you uh, it's on Hulu, YouTube TV, Fubu TV, or Fubo yep. TV, Amazon Prime, YouTube, and Google Play, from what I see. Um, and uh, if you do the Hulu, I mean, you can watch uh, Nate's favorite show, Letter Kenny, based off of his jersey <laughs> that he's got going on there. Um, you guys, no, that's not his favorite show. <laughs> <laughs> he's just from Letter Kenny. <laughs> he just drove down. He ran a guy. <laughs> um, <laughs> Peter wants to know about casual donut encounters. I'm not sure what that means, but do you oh know, Peter? God. The donuts, the, so the shipwreck is kind of neat. It's neat that we did that, but the donuts we bring on that boat are unbelievable. <laughs> really? And he comes up with this box of donuts, and if if we don't all have diabetes by the end of dive season. Uh, I believe uh, it's pronounced diabetes. Just a, <laughs> it's a medical term. <laughs> yeah, diabetes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Jason. the diabetes. <laughs> Jason, the nomad, the nomad runs on donuts. <laughs> All right. I like it. That's, that is amazing. Apparently, it does. Uh, thanks to we Peter had, for that one. We had days where Danny would show up with his um, the Danny donuts, the crack donuts, which are just you know you eat one and you're like, ah. and then the production crew would show up with a whole another dozen of gourmet donuts from this place in Portland that was you know off the charts. Yeah. You know, maple oh, yeah. cake and donuts and. Do you know the name of the place? Day, like I feel sick to my stomach. Do we know the name of the place? Yeah, <clears throat> um, I don't remember. It, Danny Donuts are Clem's Donuts in Wyndham, New Hampshire. Uh, I'm telling yeah. you, they're wicked. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll have to put a post up for that. And uh, next time I get up there, I'll have to, maybe I'll just make a trek up just for that. It's not that far. Well, when we, we started the season, my, my Revo was a micro. It's now up to a standard. Oh, wow. So, I mean, <laughs> that's just anything. Nice. Well done. Uh, so yeah. what are you guys diving for rebreathers? By by the way, I'm sure that we'll get that question eventually. Um, just revos. We're, revos. We're all on revos. <laughs> oh, let's, let's look at that. Wait, she didn't make passenger seat. What's up with that, man? <laughs> that's a bad. Yeah, yeah, she's passenger seat. She's buckled in and everything. Oh, it's passenger seat. I thought it went to the back. All right, that's fine. Then. Oh no, no, that's passenger seat all day. All right. His fiance is probably hogtied in the back seat. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. Oh, too funny. All right. So um kind of went through how you guys found the Eagle 56 a little bit. I know that that uh Ryan had done a bunch of pinging. I'm assuming you guys were on the boat for that. Is that correct? And you guys just looking for numbers or whatever? You pinging? Oh yeah, we we yeah. spent a lot of days uh looking at targets and yeah. scanning and magnetometering which didn't work so well. None of it really worked so well. That's why nobody could find it. So right. um in the end persistence, you know, we started we we located the bow June 23rd um, of 2018, which is pretty early in the season up here. That's, you know, the water is still, uh, you know, in the 40s up in the shallows. Yeah. And um, we had, uh, <coughs> we had, uh, uh, let's see, in May we'd gone up there the week before Memorial Day, which was the first day we could even get out uh, up there. The weather is wicked. And uh, we had marked some a, a target. It was 400 feet away from the wreck. We didn't know it at the time, but it, so we started the season 400 feet away from the wreck. So we had narrowed it down to um, from you know 30 odd square miles or whatever it is down to 400 feet, and and then with, you know with help you know we would work with everybody. Everybody narrowed it down from there, and we got on. So nice. Uh, I think I found the sonar image. I'm gonna throw it up on a comment on Facebook. Um, just so people understand, I, mean, I, I saw the show. So watching the show and seeing where this thing is, is settling and you're like, uh, that's a what? <laughs> like actually identifying what that thing is. You're like, I guess. Uh, all right, sure. So. And then after the Even video, the clip on the depth sounder, it, it, you look at it and most people would look at it and you wouldn't know it was a shipwreck. No. It doesn't look anything like what you'd expect. Not one bit. Yeah. Yeah. That's it, going through the show is quite impressive looking at that whole thing and that you guys found it and like you said you dove a bunch of rocks right a lot of times <laughs> we did a lot of dives from like six so the the ocean bottom off maine it, you know to give you an idea of the area we were hunting in um there was spots that were 60 80 feet deep and you go half a mile quarter mile and you're in 300 and something feet of water 340 feet of water and then it would be back up to 110 feet of water and then drop off to 400 feet of water it, it was enough that that area had been covered so much that uh, crews I had talked to there to look for it in the past, but it was actually several miles away from where the Navy said it was in about yeah. 400 feet of water. So wow. to find it as shallow as we did was actually a bonus. I thought we were going to be looking at something a lot deeper. 
Very nice. Uh, did you guys find anything else while you were looking? Um, not that you'd want to disclose, but uh, not disclose what it was, but did you discover any of the things that just say basically like a yes or no? I know how you guys are. Um, if you found other things, we're looking for that. Yeah, we had uh, we had started looking. We actually started with the Eagle. That's kind of how we got together. Uh, Danny, Ryan, and myself were kind of diving on another crew, another crew of buddies, and uh, Ryan and I particularly. And um, that kind of broke up, you know, mid uh, 2012 ish. <clears throat> and um, we were doing a lot of deep stuff with them. And uh, we were kind of out on our own. Ryan's like, I got a boat. I'm like, dude, that's all we need. Let's go, you know. And uh, um, we started looking, and like I said, we knew Danny, you know, really well. And uh, we brought him in, and the three of us just started poking around. So we started on the Eagle in 15, I think it was, and and um, uh, poked around. We got frustrated, <laughs> so <laughs> we had another wreck uh, south of the Eagle, off of New Hampshire. We're closer to our home. You know, it's about a three-hour drive up to Portland for me, and um, called the uh, William H. Machen. Mm -hmm. And she was a 300 and something foot um, coal carrier, collier, you know, sunk in World War II. And that was kind of, a, you know, that's our backyard, you know, our, our downright backyard, the whole area. <laughs> the, uh, um, you know, it was, uh, uh, we kind of, it was just too much driving up to Portland every weekend to just look at rocks. So uh, we started looking for the Machen. We turned up the Machen in 17. Uh, we did a good solid year of diving on that, announced it in the fall. And then um, it was right back on in 2018. We were we were gonna get the eagle for sure. Now that was like this is our target now. So yeah. we did find other stuff. There were fishing a couple fishing boats, and uh, there's a, a little freighter out there in 310 feet of water. And there's another target we think is a, a it looks on side scan. We never actually got to dive in it. It's a, it looks like um, the old S boats. You know they mm -hmm. turned into fishing boats, um, yeah. not, not S subs, but Sub chaser boats, you know, yep. boats of these. and they were a lot of them were turned into fishing boats at the end. And there's one out there um, east of the Eagle in um, just shy of 400 feet of water, which we were going to dive. We marked it a couple times. Might be good porthole opportunities. I don't know. <laughs> you know like, <laughs> a lot of water up here to just yeah. go look at something that's not what we were looking for. So um, we, there are other there is other stuff that we've we found over the last. 20 years with the Donna crew and that and everything else. We found a lot of wrecks off of Boston in that area. Yep. Um, many from barges to scuttles. There was a lot of scuttles in the thirties and forties when they were cleaning up Boston Harbor. Yeah. So, but the Machen and the Eagle are the big ones too. Nice. So yeah, that, that's a conversation I had with Gareth Locke earlier when I was doing the, the, uh, the one o'clock kind of meeting was, um, the, the term survivorship bias of basically everybody sees the Instagram photos, everybody sees Ryan's pictures or whoever was taking a, um, or the TV show or whatever. And they see the end result of these three hours of, Oh my God, you guys drove out, ping the wreck and jumped it and you hit it. And then you're famous. Um, it's in their eyes of what went down. So it's, I mean, it's nice to hear about all the different, you know, or for people to hear about all the different things you guys had to go through to kind of find that. Um, from the, I mean, you guys said you got frustrated from the safety standpoint. Were there were there issues you guys had to deal with trying to figure out how to do this, or you've been doing it long enough that um, you kind of knew what you were doing on that end? We had been doing it. Uh, we did a lot of 300 range open circuit stuff, 300, 310 foot open circuit stuff. Um, back in the late 2000s, we started diving with uh, a crew off Boston. Uh, Bob Foster, uh, myself, Ryan, everybody, Al, Jack. Um, and we did a whole lot of stuff out there. Uh, Bob and those guys had done the Palmer Prairie and had done the uh, Witcher in 370, and they had done the Portland, which is in 460. So, um, you know, and we had been diving 300 pretty regularly. So we had uh, all jumped to rebreathers around 2010. Uh, I think between 2010 and 2012, I jumped, and then Ryan jumped, a couple of the other guys jumped. So uh, there was a bit of a learning curve trying to do this stuff. Learn to do this up all over again on closed circuit. The rebreather yeah. makes it easier for sure, but there are other considerations you have to watch for. So, um, the um, it was uh, yeah, I guess it was like yeah, fourteen, fifteen when we really got kind of wrapping back up the deep stuff again. Nice. Uh, you know, sub three hundred stuff. We dove the uh, Nate, you were I don't know we dove the uh, Bradley in thirteen out in Lake Michigan, that's in 380, and then the Palmer Prairie in 370. 
in 14. So we, we had a fair chunk of, I don't mean to, I'm not too, I, we had a fair chunk of warm up dives uh, yep. for this type of diving. And then you kind of fall back into it regularly. Up here, you follow the temperature curve. So as the water warms, you go deeper, deeper, deeper and then as the water cools, you start shallow up again. Yep. Yeah. And it's only you know, the nice right. part about this team is that safety wise, we're streamlining everything. Like we've made changes in the last two years, uh, as far as implementing a checklist before you jump, um, that we didn't do prior. And we started catching each other on little mistakes that, you know, like your dry suit inflator wasn't hooked up or whatever. And then, you know, we're asking run times, gas mixes and stuff like that, just so that we're all on the same page. We know what's going on and it, makes you cognitive of what you're doing so you don't lose sight of you know safety so every time we go out we streamline a little better and make it a little safer for everybody involved nice so where are you guys getting that checklist from that's a that's a great point is it a checklist you're using and you're modifying or or how did you how did you guys come up with that checklist it's one we it's drew up one that we came up with yeah yeah we, we looked we looked at where the mistakes were happening and i mean people can set their rebreathers up however they want everybody dies with the configuration this checklist is um you know you're gonna splash, and it's and it's you know we we lost I've lost a couple of friends um, on breathers, but you know you look at how this stuff happens, and it, basic questions: Are your primary electronics on? Are your secondary electronics on? Yes, yes. You know this is a diver that is geared to splash, and yeah. you got to remember we self crew, so you're being crewed by rebreather divers, so people, you know, so um, oxygen on, um, you know, right down to this. It's a it's about a sixty second thing. Right down to um, you know wing and dry suit because yeah. we don't want any dirt darts you know so mm -hmm. it sucks when you're heavy you know you with bottles and everything you roll over the side of the boat and you <laughs> no gas <laughs> nothing yeah. sucked up you know and now you're plummeting towards the bottom so uh -huh. it is a super simple checklist but the amount of things like I can't tell you the amount of times I've left my secondary computer sitting on the the up on the console of the boat um, you know th there's a lot going on on a small boat you know we have especially in a changeover because we dive one crew. And then they come up, and then you, you know the second crew is in there, right? So, and you flip. So the the gear, the deck just gets strewn with gear and everything else, and everybody's kind of shuffling around. Yep. That's the, that's the most critical time. For me. So, yep. and the, and all our checklist does is make sure you're going off the side of the boat with gases, you know, gases are on, rebreathers on, and working, and your PO2 is up, and you know you you you've got everything you need to sustain life. So Good. that's all our checklist does. I love that. Is that uh, publicly available, or or what's the I think we can make we it. Yeah. If, if you guys would share that, that'd be amazing. I'm sure a bunch of people would love that. I mean, that's, um, and that's the kind of been our topic today in general. We talked about checklists earlier with uh, Gareth Locke and a bunch of other stuff, but um, I think safety is, and, and those sorts of things and hearing people, especially in your position that they're doing that is massive and can really make an effect on the, uh, the safety of the, I mean, look at the number of people that jump in with their O2 off, right? <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. Need you need to fix that's, that. it right there. that's the third question on the checklist. Yeah. I think if I recall off the top of my head. So, yeah. So, the yeah. thing about the crew is, too, is nobody nobody has an ego. So, like, if we get out there, we've been over the wreck before. Everybody looked at each other and said, ah, uh, let's go have breakfast. And we'll yep. bag it, drive back in, and go because the conditions were not okay. And every one of us have ended up over the wreck. And whether it be something's going on at home, whether you had a bad, you know, I drive four and a half hours to get up to Portland when we're diving. Yep. Something goes wrong. None of us have any problem just bowing out and saying, no, nah, not today. Yep. You know, the wreck's Every not going anywhere. And that's huge that yeah. you don't, you don't dive on your ego. Yeah. We've done that. We've done that a bunch. Like we, I remember a day on the Mage and everybody drove, we had a full boat. I think it was five guys. We had a full boat. Uh, like Nate said, he's he's a you know three, four hour drive from Vermont. I'm a two and an hour to, and change dive to the coast, drive to the coast. Um, you know, everybody's coming from a couple hours away and we got out there and it was a gorgeous day here. But by the time we got there, it was pea soup fog. And I mean, yeah. I mean fog, like you couldn't see off the bow of the boat and you know, we're steaming 15 miles offshore to do a 300 foot dive. And we all kind of were like, eh, you know, <laughs> I don't mm -hmm. know. And we had just on the back too. I mean, this was, this was hot, you know, we were still finding areas and finding artifacts and, and everybody kind of was like, yeah, I don't feel good about this. We turned the rope, we turned the boat around, put it back on the trailer. Put everybody's gear back in their cars and we went ahead for breakfast. <laughs> I think that like, I think that is massive. Like that's a huge, I mean, that's worth stating again. It's basically you guys drove three to five hours to get to the boat, geared up the boat, geared up yourselves, got out to the wreck, and turned the boat around and came back home because basically <clears throat> you guys weren't feeling it. 
Um, yep. Well, you figure one diver gets blown off that wreck in the pea soup fog. Even though we had radar, we could see other boats, but we lose somebody out there. What are you going to do? Yep. You know? Yeah. Yep. I think so many people miss that fact of being like, oh, yeah, you know, they, they get they succumb to the pressure of, of not saying something when they should. Um, and that's, I, run by the, I run by the rule of threes, me personally. You know, three things go wrong, and I don't care how nice the day it is. I'm sitting open. Yep. I, I had a day way back, I don't know, 15 years ago, we were on a wreck uh, called the uh, the YF-415 off Boston. Deeper wreck, you know? Yep. And um, <clears throat> I'm on a charter boat. Paid 80 bucks to be there. And, I, you know, I've been known the captain forever. And you know, I just I had a reg blow out. I had stuff go right. Just stuff wasn't going right. And it was a gorgeous day. I mean, it was like a freaking lake. You know, we had a molar molar on the surface. It was just the perfect day. And it was not good for me. And when I started getting out of my gear, everybody's splashing. And says, you know, what are you doing? I said, you know what? I, I'm just not feeling it today, you know? And I, I, I handed out cantaloupe to the guy <laughs> after he came back up and listened to the stories. But. You got to listen to the stories. That's what matters. You cannot at this le- at any level, really, right. you know, because every you know levels are, it's 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 all uh, perspective. I mean, a single tank in uh, eighty feet of water is the same thing as a rebreather in three hundred feet of water, right? Yeah. So yep. anybody can have a bad day, um, you know. And uh, the key is is not to push it and to just say when. You know, I think people get wrapped up. They pay money for the charter. They drove all day. They spent all the money on gas and everything like that. And, you can't be like that. You gotta just. Right. It's your your birthday. You get a nice day on the boat. You hang out, eat a peanut butter sandwich, and, and, and have a good time with your buddies. That's just how it is. You know, so. Yeah, that's massive. I mean, that, that and and the fact that everybody feels comfortable in that group to be able to do that. I mean, that takes. They have to create that culture at the same time that you can actually do well, that, which is massive. The plus side. The plus side is if you do sit out on on the nomad. If you sit out, um, you know, and you get everybody else in the water, is you have at least three. I was tamper with everybody's gear down below. So <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah, everybody has their phone in lock mode, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> I bet they do. That is amazing. I'm sure that there's plenty of pictures. We from our January party, there are some pictures on my phone. I apparently didn't lock it when I decided to serve some beers. So I've got some interesting yeah. photos. <laughs> Nomad, an interesting fact about Nomad is Nomad is the one boat dive boat in the Northeast that has a that has a gun bucket. <laughs> <laughs> That is hilarious. That is too funny. I love it. Oh you know, we get, we go to, you know, if we're going to end up going to mass, Ryan sends around a thing. Listen, guys, everybody's <laughs> going to leave the guns at home. <laughs> oh, Lord. That's too funny. Oh, I love it. Um, so uh, what other warm-up wrecks have you guys been doing? Do you guys do a lot of specific warm-up wrecks, or do you have certain ones you target normally, or how do you guys pick your target wrecks to uh, warm up for different explorations? Based on the winds, really. I mean, yeah. the bonus to having Ryan's boat on a trailer is if the wind is blowing one way, we can go here. If it's blowing another way, we can go there. Fair enough. So we know different wrecks in different spots. We've got a tugboat that we like to dive in the spring because it's 140, 150, and uh, we can get a nice long dive on that in the cold, cold water. And then yeah. if that doesn't work out, we got some wrecks south of us that we can go hit. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's... Uh, I see, you see a lot of these guys with, you know, these super nice boats, big boats. They got a 50 foot, you know, sleeps 12 and, you know, it's awesome. But, the, you know, to me, well, things are different down in New York and, and stuff like that. Cause you got to steam a hundred miles offshore, but yeah. you know, for what we do up here, Ryan's boat on the trailer is, you know, it's 27 feet. It's just big enough that, you know, I mean, it's just small enough that you can trailer it. Having the boat on the trailer. I, hey, how many nights have we had where, you know, 10 o'clock at night and we're all on messenger going I don't know, man. What's it look like? Well, it doesn't look good. Well, it looks <laughs> you know, and yeah, you, for sure. the and you can pick a direction and go. That's huge because when you're stuck to a when you're stuck to a harbor, yeah. you know, you got a, you got a forty beautiful forty foot boat, but when it's blowing in your port, it, that's it. You, you can't go anywhere. So yeah. even we even have a wreck. We even have a wreck in a lake north of us right here, about an hour north of us in Sunapee. It's in sixty feet of water, but God damn it, when the wind's blowing for three weeks. Yeah. If you start getting desperate, you can always get in there. So, you know, there's always something when you have a trailer boat. Yeah, we, we have a wreck that's a shore dive. That we could probably, most of us could draw with our eyes closed and <laughs> we dive it when we need to. So it happens a Damn. lot. So um, teams, how do you guys set up your teams? Is it teams two, three, four? How do you guys do that? And um... Depends on the day. We usually get Nate off the boat first because we don't like them. Yeah, it works. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Well, Ryan and I generally tend to dive together. Um, Nate and Josh tend to dive together, Mark and Don and Danny and Bob. They're yeah. kind of, you know, we can, I don't know. And we all dive with each other, too. I mean, if we're having the, the day where Ryan's, you know, um, what did we do on Sunday? Ryan's rebreather wasn't ready. He had traveled with it and it was still backed up. So, you know, I think uh, Matt and Bob and I jumped in the water and then Nate and Josh, you know, we just splashed with whoever is around, whoever is doing a similar plan that day or, um, you know, it, it, it all depends. We'll have days that the weather's real rough. Ryan wants me to drive, so he'll splash with Danny and, and I'll splash with Bob. And, you know, <laughs> most of the guys are getting pretty good at driving the boat, so that's actually really nice. Yeah. Um, but um, everybody is everybody is cross cross trained and you know handling the boat and on deck stuff and everybody's these guys are the best of the best, you know, in my yep. book. So, um, and we all trust each other. That's the biggest one in this in this end of it because you not only trust the guy you're in depth with on inside the wreck, but you got to trust the guys above you that they're going to be there. I mean, we had a day. Um, I think it was, uh, I feel like it was Josh, uh, Danny, Bob, and, my, and Ryan, and myself. Um, we had a day early in the year, uh, last year actually, and um, we had steamed up to the Eagle, but we had left from Wells, or it might have been the year previous year, I guess it was last year. And you know, it's like a 60 mile round trip. And uh, we left in the morning, it was just a quarter of a day, flat, calm, beautiful, and Ryan and I splashed and surfaced after a couple hour dive and it was like four footers you see the boat is like this and then it disappears and then it's up and then i look up and danny's boys and ghosty driving the boys like <laughs> it, was a rough, it was it took us like two and a half hours to get home you know i mean it was oh, it just sucked so you gotta trust the guys that are sitting topside you know? yeah yeah definitely um so well i guess the question is uh, are you guys currently looking for rotten wood or rusted metal right now? A little bit of both. Neither. A little bit of both. Neither, neither nothing. You're doing nothing. You're just driving a boat around, right? You got nothing. They're all, they're all found. <laughs> they're all found. Just driving. Yeah. Eating peanut butter sandwiches. We, we have, um, I don't want to give out names publicly. Yeah. We yeah. have uh, two, two very large uh, steel wrecks um, that are lost up here that um, – have been looked for. Um, the problem we kind of have now is everything is looking like it's going to get real deep from here on. I mean, we found all the shallower stuff. So, right, yeah. um, you know, so uh, we've got one target that's in real deep water, um, and we have another target that we suspect is going to be in deep water. But we have, we have a target we've been looking for up off the mid coast of Maine. Right. We've covered. Uh, we've been up there. Uh, we've made two trips for. I feel like it's seven days, I think, of of, of tow and something like that. And, you know, we've, we've covered a, a pretty good chunk of bottom and still no wreck. But, you know, it gets expensive when you figure in hotels and fuel and everything else. So you got to kind of make the most of it. But uh, I'm worried now that um, it's going to be further east than we thought and it's going to be it's sub 400. Yeah. So it, it'll be tough diving up there in a knot and a half current, not, not a current and yeah. 30 degree water. You know, those depths <laughs> are tough. So. Yeah. We'll see what we get. I don't know. We just go turn them up, and then we'll worry about you find them, and then you worry about how to dial them. Right. Yeah. Them right. That makes sense. Uh, have you guys done anything freshwater or lakes or rivers besides just coming up in in the Jordan? Um. Yeah, we've got the Weedamu and Sunapee, which is our fun wreck when it's when yep. it's blowing. Um. We went out to the Great Lakes. We've made a few trips out to the Great Lakes. We go Presque Isle a few times. Um. We go. Manistique, uh, Lake Superior, Lake Michigan. I need Lake Erie. All right. Eric, yeah. Eric Petrovic, if you're listening, I need Lake Erie. <laughs> so, <laughs> I feel like Erie from the Great Lakes hat trip. It's been hat trip. It's been, I go Lake Ontario in uh, 99 or 2000. That was my first time in, in the Great Lakes. I was hooked. And it's been, it's now 2020 and I'm, I still haven't gotten Lake Erie. So. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I've done a bunch of stuff up in Lake Champlain with Josh. Him and I took nice. a boat up there and camped out on the islands and just hit a bunch of wrecks up there. Yeah. Um, and then the Great Lakes and some nice. other smaller lakes around here and stuff. So. Yeah, we're uh, we're planning to go to Lake Erie at some point in time once this whole thing blows over. So um, if he doesn't come through, you guys are more than welcome to come with us or we'll figure it out. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, Dave wants to know: There are there plans for the Navy for you to take a plaque to the wreck for members of the crew lost? I'm assuming that's Eagle Fifty Six. 
Uh, the families actually have um, a plaque, I believe. Um, we had a memorial service, which this is what I'm most pissed about for the whole nine yards, is we had a memorial service for all this stuff going on. We had a memorial service uh, scheduled for May 2nd. Uh. Paul, Paul Lawton took charge of making a, um, a new headstone. So there's a, there's a memorial stone at Portland Head, Fort Williams in uh, Portland, which is about the closest playhouse to the to the rec site. And... Um, uh, he made a second plaque that has all the crewmen's names, um, a, a second head, you know, memorial, granite memorial, big granite memorial. Went through all the plans, all the approvals with the state and the town and, and uh, the main maritime museum is going to look after it, like the old one. Yep. And, and um, we, had a, we had a big dedication planned for May 2nd with uh, Marines were going to be there for an honor guard. We even worked to, to the point where we even had a, we put an application for a, a military flyover. You know, I mean, oh, this was going to yeah. be a big thing. We had families coming in from all over uh, <laughs> west and down south. And we had a lot of families coming. And we, we just got the message that it has to be canceled now. So yeah. we're going to have to reschedule it all. But uh, as far as for David, as far as a, a, a plaque on the wreck, yeah, we, there is uh, plans to uh, bring the family. We had the Coast Guard to this point. We had the Coast Guard lined up with 180 foot buoy, 160 foot buoy tender to bring all the families, um, the military with an honor guard and everything else to, to the rec site to have a service. Wow. And we would have liked to have been able to go down and put the plaque on. Maybe we can still do it this, this summer. And we got a lot of, a lot of year left. This whole thing will blow over hopefully in a few months here. Be all set. But yeah. there, there are problems, yes. Uh, what is the depth on that? I don't, I'm not sure if we said it or if we need to say it again. What's the depth on the Eagle? Uh, 250 to just shy of 300 feet of water. Okay. Depends on where you are. It's a, it's a big rec site. It's, it's yeah. stretched out over a large area. And um, um, that's, uh, you know, it, it, <laughs> that was half the problem. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, you're in two, 250 to 300, roughly. Nice. Uh, and to answer Ross Baxter, yes, it is the, the real Jeff Gaudreau. It is him. It is absolutely him. It, it took a lot to get him here. A couple of peanut butter sandwiches, and uh, we had to get some beer transported from uh, Vermont for him, but we got him. So. Jason, Jason, I'm pretty sure this is where I'm supposed to say, I'm Jeff Gaudreau. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That is too funny. Um, my, my friend, uh, my, our friend Dennis has been putting together a series of videos that uh, do a I'm Jeff Goodrow. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah, you guys should share that. and That'd be great. We should put those up there. <laughs> oh, it's on, no, it's on Facebook. <laughs> oh, it is? Okay, I'll look for that. This would be amazing. We'll have to share that. <laughs> it's ridiculously funny. He's definitely put some effort in. They're really well done. <laughs> I love that. Fortunately, he's boats in the water, so if we get him a girlfriend, we'll never get another video on That's good. That's a good thing. <laughs> um... Have you guys done any exploration with uh, with Ryan's boat in the the lakes or rivers, or are you guys trying to keep it pretty much offshore type stuff? We're mostly saltwater. Okay. Yeah, we, we've uh, there's been talk, you know, all along of some projects inland. It'd be nice to have a lot of going on in the ocean and have something we could fall back on inshore for that early season and late season. But yep, um, I can't think of any off the top of my head right now. No. All right. Fair enough. Uh, we got deep finger lakes out this way. I'm not sure exactly what the deal is. There's some lost airplane possible stuff and things like that. But if you guys are, would be interested, you guys are more than welcome to come out this way. And we're just at the start of them. So if you guys need something, you're more than welcome to come I mean, out. And, I was coming back with Don Ferraro, who's another guy in the team. I'm sorry, I should have mentioned this earlier. The team is, uh, is well, myself, Brian King, Nate, Josh Cummings, um, Bob Foster, and Danny Allen. Pretty sure. Nate, I got them all right. Mark Bowers. Mark Bowers, yeah. So, uh, Don Fryer and I went Sorry, out Mark. to the Great Lakes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Don Fryer and I went out to the Great Lakes back in 2012, I think it was, and we we dove. We were diving with Yitka, and um, we dove all day, and then we were just like, "Wow, oh, let's just drive home," you know. So that's like a 16-hour drive. Over. <laughs> so we're coming back through. We passed through Syracuse. You know, your yep. your neck of the woods. I'm sorry, we were gonna stay in Syracuse, and we didn't make Syracuse. We ended up staying in a hotel in Rochester at yep. like one o'clock in the morning. Yeah. yeah, big mistake. Don't stay at a hotel in Rochester. <laughs> you truly really tell you that was a. We were, we were in at one a.m. and we were out by six. See yeah. you later. <laughs> yep. Uh, I think Chris so, Hamlick's still on here. Chris is from Rochester. Hey, Chris. <laughs> um, too funny. Uh, yeah, it's an interesting town. It's all right, though. Uh, we got some guys that come out from Buffalo and Rochester area that come dive a bunch. So, um, yeah, that the St. Lawrence is a big draw. So we're kind oh, of straight through us. Yeah. So 
having um, having Andrew and Bob on the U.S. side is huge now. You know, I've been yeah. I've been on the Georgia. I've been diving the Georgia. Did my first Georgia dive I think in two thousand two. I think it was. Yeah. And we did everything. We always did everything from the Canadian side. Yeah. Because it was no, you know. Yeah. Having Andrew and Bob and Hunts and all that is is um is real nice on the U.S. side because it knocks you know an hour round trip and probably more. Oh yeah. So, yeah. I, I quite enjoyed that. Yeah. Yeah, and it's it's very different crossing the border at this point in time than it was before, and and all that fun stuff. So, um, having it from this side is is pretty nice. We were the same way going going to the Canadian side for everything, and then started using hunts a little bit more, and and it's been been really nice to get on all those, and you know, Vickery and Jodry and all those. So, I feel like we were up there. I think it was well, it had to have been October because yeah. nobody up there in December. Um, and you were on hunts, and we were on Andrews boat. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I wasn't. I wasn't on the Jodry that day, but I was on a different wreck that day. The a couple of days oh, before right. that, I think was was was. was gotcha. yeah. yeah, that was a fun trip. Yeah, that was yeah. a great trip. There was uh, some excellent diving for sure. Oh yeah, and it's it's always pretty calm, you know. So it's always reasonable. So we hit, hit up the Key Storm in America a good amount, and then uh, the Vickery, which is always fun that crow's nest, but but you can't pull anything off them. No, no. no. <laughs> yeah. You guys going a little convulsions about that? Like you wish you could? Yeah, I, I have a I have a friend who showered me nameless for she called her. Uh, <laughs> Every time we go to the fresh water, he's like, God damn it, what are you doing? You can't take nothing. It's like going to a strip club and, and you can't touch. <laughs> I love it. I'm sure Richie Kohler is going to really appreciate you letting that out there. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah, no. uh, yeah, yeah, we do. We do. We're all brass hounds pretty bad. So, uh, yeah. yeah, it's it's always tough to go out to Lake Michigan, but it's really nice seeing everything on the wrecks out there. Those those wrecks are going to be here for right. 100, 100 more years. I mean, they're not going anywhere. The saltwater wrecks, you know, you yep. see a wreck, we, you know, we've got a, I don't know how many wrecks off the coast, a, a freaking thousand of them, but by uh, you know 100 years 150 years they're they're in the dirt and they're gone so yeah, yeah. You know, saltwater wrecks just don't hold up so yeah. the stuff's just gonna yeah. disappear anyways it's so. a very different game you know cold fresh water they're they're gonna be there forever and and the saltwater ones are gonna disintegrate essentially yeah oh look at you, <laughs> <laughs> you got your china oh, oh yeah Got it all. All kinds of good stuff. Yeah, that's that is one thing we do miss. But but also, like you said, they're going to be here forever. So that that's a that's a pro, I guess. Yeah, we got to get Richie buttoned down. He said he's going to do one of these later on, one of these weeks. But uh, I know he's super busy. So uh, he's a pretty busy guy, and I'm sure all this uh, coronavirus apocalypse is not helping anybody right now. So yeah. you know, yeah. I, I appreciate you setting all this up. This has been yeah. fun. Yeah, my pleasure. Actually, yeah. it's been a, a you guys are the second one to do, and it's been a it's kind of oddly open ending and, and everybody's been pretty good so far. So about, you know, contributing, you know, my biggest fear is getting started and asking a couple of questions being like, yep. Okay. Uh, <laughs> where do we go from there? <laughs> People are trying to shut us up. <laughs> I am perfectly Once you fine. Once get started, it's all over. Yeah. <laughs> I, see our, I see our friend Dennis. Yeah. yeah I'm Jeff Goodrow guy is he, he just logged on here. I, I see him oh, commenting. Yeah. So, yeah. It's a, uh, uh, no, Dennis, we do not leave anything for anybody else. <laughs> That's the New England way. <laughs> <laughs> get, they get to see it, but at your house. They have to come over. Absolutely. You put a picture on Facebook nowadays. You know, let me tell you, yeah. there's only going to be a handful of people that ever go to these wrecks that deep, yeah. and um, at least before there's smudges in the dirt. And, uh, you know, you put a picture on Facebook, and uh, I, 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 I've been known to uh, – Frequent a scuba diving page on Facebook, <laughs> and uh, you know, but everybody everybody complains, you know, but don't touch the fish and crap. But you know, thousands of people see it. There's forty thousand people in, in in there alone, and yep. you know, you're, you're lucky if you'll ever get forty. Uh, yeah. Ever seen something like that? Like the bell alone, the big bell was buried in the mud. I mean, nobody yeah. was gonna find it. You know, there was like a strip this big sticking out of the mud. You know, at three hundred feet. So. Yeah, like, the, like a lot of those wrecks. I mean, you, you look at the Dory and how many people have been to the Dory, a good number, but that's not a very large number, you know, by any means. And you start looking at like Empress of Ireland. I mean, that's freshwater, but still, like, that's, yeah. there's not many people that really truly go there all that often. So bringing that's that back is huge. My short list. We've been talking about taking the Nomad up there for a few years now. Speaking of, of wrecks that, you know, kind of out that way. 
That is um, on my short list also. Yeah, that one's uh, yep. it's dark and yep. cold and the St. Lawrence right currents and yeah, it's a. Uh, I got a lot of people that want to do it, but I'm like, ah, uh, you do realize what you're getting into there, <laughs> because, but it's shallow enough that people think they can do it. They don't really realize what it takes to get there, which is interesting. So, but yeah, we've got a good number of warm up wrecks. I I take them down to the uh, the crow's nest of the Vickery before I let them make that decision and let them see what's up because <laughs> that's a little different. So, you guys been on the Vickery? Oh, yeah. Times. Okay, good. Yep. Yeah, that's pretty much the answer. Yeah, that yeah, one everyone's seen. <laughs> if you do the Acanto, uh, which is directly across from the Vickery, that's a good dive too. But scary as shit without a scooter. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Get the current run. Yeah, we uh, we're just taking out. We got the new Divex Piranhas. We're gonna or the Divex uh, Black Tips. We're gonna take out and start. It's more, I guess, more of a recreational type of scooter, but it still kind of has some chops to it. So we're gonna check those out next weekend and see what they got. I know. I know a lot of guys go right down the Vickery mast yep. across the bottom and you're on the Oconto. Oh, nice. It's right, right there. Yeah. They're right yeah. next to each other. So yeah. good That's, stuff. that was my plan to get back in the States from Canada. If we got stuck there a couple weekends ago, I was just going to scoot it across. <laughs> <laughs> so we, right. we get stuck in, but it's because, you know, prison. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Fair enough. They usually ask him to leave. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, all right, so let's uh, let's hit one more serious thing, and then um, we'll get off. We get about ten more minutes of, of plan time. I really could care less if we go over, but um, and it's if you guys want to share, if you don't want to share, however you guys want to do it. But I figure I should ask um, accidents, incidences, things you guys have learned from diving these wrecks, and um, kind of maybe some stories to bring to light some ways that people could possibly learn to be better divers, type of stuff. My biggest thing is complacency kills. I lost a very good friend of mine the year that we found the uh, Eagle 56. Mm -hmm. He died in my arms at the surface on a dive. Um, I was teaching an advanced open water class and I invited him to fill the boat, you know, and he went down, did a dive and ultimately things went wrong. And did not, I don't want to blame him, but there were things that he did being complacent that took his life. Um, and it's a big lesson to learn that you need to check yourself and you need to really, really watch what you're doing because this dive that I take advanced open water students down on is, is kind of the stepping stone for all the divers here in New England. Yep. And he'd been on it many, many times and things went sideways and that was the end of it. You yep. know, and I lost a really good friend that day and it changed me underwater. I have less dives on the Eagle boat than all the other crew based on the fact that I would get there and this was in my head and I just be like, guys, I'm not diving today. And it happened a lot because of, you know, that kind of situation. And you got to remember, you know, if you don't uh, make the call or don't follow the rules and you bend them at all, it'll take you and it'll take you quickly. Yep. So, yeah. Yeah. The, the deeper you go, the faster it happens too. You know, yeah. I, 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 mean, I, <laughs> I, I was there, to, you know, Back in the 90s with a single tank and, you know, I can get 132, you know, and, and but boy, I'll tell you, it always gets you at the end of the dive. Ryan and I were on a dive um, on the Nezuscot, which is in about 240-ish, um, but it's in, it's in an area where it, the visibility, it's like the mud hole in Jersey. It's just bad. It just sucks. The visibility is terrible. Great wreck, vis dead. And um, we were pulling the hook after, I mean, I'm sorry, the shot line, and um, <laughs> we were pulling the, uh, the weight, and... Um, Ryan clipped his uh, loopos on a piece of metal that um, we never even saw. Yeah. And you know, we were a half hour, 40 minutes into the bottom. And, you know, suddenly he's bailing out at 130 feet, 140 feet on the way up with hours of decompression. So um, things get real, real fast. So I would say definitely know your gas, you know, know your bailout. Test your rebreather plan, your bailout plan before – you, you really need it because I've had uh, a couple of scary instances in regards to that where um, when things happen, they happen really fast, and that's not when you want to be wondering if you have enough gas to make the service. You know? yeah. um, so, yeah. but like Nate said, complacency is always the biggest one. I, I think of a couple of friends I've lost, and um, unfortunately, um, you know, complacency is a part of them always. It always seems like it. We, we, we started the checklist. Because we were, I felt I was getting complacent. I mean, we were, I think we all were to a point. We do every weekend, you know, 
Yeah. Same guys, same boat, same wrecks, you know, bang, 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 these depths, just over and over. You know, they sound really deep right now, but when you're doing them over and over and over and over again all year long, and I know a lot of the guys on here and probably, you know, a lot of my, my wreck diving friends, you just get into this rhythm. Same gas, same, you, you, with the rebreathers, you blend up one big bank of gas and it's just top it off, top it off, top it off. Yeah. And you get complacent, you know, and you start forgetting your secondary computer. You start forgetting to turn your oxygen on. You start forgetting to turn your backup computer on or your backup PO2 on. And, um, you know, I, I've seen some um, accidents that could have been very unfortunate had they not been caught. Unfortunately, they were. Um, being in a tight-knit group where everybody knows everything, everybody knows your kit, everybody knows where you're diving, they know what to look for when something's not right. They know what to look for when you're not right. You know, I've had... I, I, I went. I had a lot. I got married last year. My beautiful wife is glaring at me because it's dinner time. And um, tell her four and a half minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you know, I, I had a lot going on last year. My knee. I had knee surgery over this winter, and my knee was really bothering me um, to the point where I'd swim and it would feel like it was going to explode. You know, Ryan and I were on the boilers and we're at 200 feet. And the current was up, and I'm, I, I had all I could do to make it back to the line. I'm pulling on the bottom because every time I frog kick my knee. Felt like it was going to explode between yeah. that and the wedding and i just had a lot going on last year yeah i i, I backed off the deep stuff i would drive up and drive the boat for the guys i how many i don't know how many trips i made to portland and everything else to drive the boat you know and all these guys have done that you know coming josh coming from the cape you know crazy two hours round trip just to drive the boat so we could dive more efficiently you know yeah. so um know your limits and yeah don't get complacent yeah and that's that whole normalization of deviance too. Oh, I did this and nothing happened. I did this and nothing happened. I did this and nothing happened. And suddenly you're having that discussion earlier today of, you know, that's, yep. that's massive. So, um, well, one last question before we jump off and you get to have some dinner is, uh, Ross wants me to ask about your scooter. What's going on there? Ask about uh, scooters? Yeah, your scooter, apparently. Ask Jeff about his scooter. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, it sounds like good. This good story for everybody's giggling. <laughs> a couple of friends of ours, archery, right? <laughs> a couple of friends of ours, we've been um, doing New Year's Eve together. I'm not a big drinker, you know. None of yeah. us are really big drinkers, you know. And a couple times in the year, I usually see Rovers VPS. You know, yeah. Over winter, you know, we, we unload a little bit, and um, we've been doing New Year's Eve for I don't know, crazy 15, 20 years, and. Um, uh, we we got a little too rowdy. Um, the girls went to bed, and we stayed up and continued drinking, and which is rare. And uh, I think it was like about uh, midnight, twelve thirty, one o'clock. We were going to play a video game that you could shoot them up, and we couldn't get the video game to work, so we decided to actually go shoot them up. <laughs> okay. and long story short, it was two a.m. and we we're shooting my crossbow in the basement when my scooter got knocked <laughs> over and broken and. Uh, shredded stuff yeah it was just a bad night you know my wife wow. made us go to bed and she heard let's go shoot guns <laughs> <laughs> that's always good she, she, she put the kibosh on it also yeah but that's how my scooter got broken with it. oh wow. what kind of scooter was it i was in old apollo but i'll tell you what dug holes great it had just enough power to dig holes but um you know uh <laughs> it was nice and small for the boats but Nice. God rest the soul. <laughs> yep. Uh, we actually have a serious question. Somebody just chimed in, so we should probably answer that since we're just BSing here. Uh, thoughts on safety rebreathers versus open circuit? For shallow stuff, open circuit is the way, in my opinion, shallow <laughs> stuff, open circuit is the way to go. It's just easier. You dive in unknown gas. It's just not stuff to worry about. Um, for deeper stuff, rebreathers, hands down. Rebreathers bring a lot of their own complications, but you have time. And um, let me tell you, when you're in – you know, 300 feet of water and your buddy is hung up in a net or you're lost inside the wreck um, and you've got five minutes of open circuit gas or you've got five hours of rebreather gas, you know, <laughs> yeah. that, that time matters. Sometimes just that extra 10 minutes is all you need to get out of a situation that you're in. So uh, for deep stuff, not even looking at cost of helium or anything like that, for deep stuff, rebreather is, you know, below 250. If you're diving, now I'm, I'm sure my buddy Matt and all, you know, rebreather instructors, they're, they're gonna roll their eyes but in my opinion if you're doing regular sub 200 dives you know 180 200 up here 180 is a big depth because it's a big shelf if you're doing regular dives to those depths um <clears throat> start looking at a rebreather now you know get going on a rebreather you'll find it's worth it if you're just doing you know 
one 150 dive, 130 dive, a couple a year, you know, to the 853 or something like that. Just to get a set of doubles and take an advanced nitrox deco class, a, a good advanced nitrox deco class. Um, you can learn a ton and you can do some serious bottom time with a set of doubles and, and, a, and a, they'll, they'll a stage or a um, deco bottle, you know. So to me, that's rebreathers beyond 200 feet. Rebreathers really come into their realm. You know, I see people in 50 feet of water with them and it's kind of like, they, you know, but everybody, you know, everybody wants to do it. But for us, for what we do, rebreathers are the only way to go. Nate, thought process on that, OC versus uh, CC for th safety? Uh, definitely a, a rebreather is the way to go is for what we're doing. I mean, barring the safety side for the length of time that you have to sort problems out, like Jeff said, gas cost alone, I couldn't afford to do the dives we're doing. We're doing, you know, 200 plus, 300 foot, you know, every weekend we can get in the water. On a set of doubles, that's $180 worth of gas in yeah. one shot versus six cubic feet in my rear breather, you know? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. that yeah. that way it makes sense. And as far as – I think the question was for bailout, though, right? Uh, thoughts on safety, rebreather versus OC was just that was the question. Straight oh, up. okay. Safety-wise, I mean, I remember when I first started doing the rebreather, I read an article that said you shouldn't dive a rebreather unless you can build one. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to build one. And I did. And safety-wise – I, I can't see why you wouldn't want to dive it. It's very simplistic. There's a few things that you have to check. And as long as those check out, chances are things are going to be fine with it. And then bailing out, you know, is always an option, you know, and that's when you switch over to open circuit anyway. So yeah. the, the rebreather is the way to go. And then if you have to get off the rebreather and onto open circuit, we're all open circuit divers to begin with. And it's, it's just kind of going home, you know, you pop it in and get on out. So. Yeah. A, a lot has to happen on a rebreather too before you actually physically have to bail off of it. Usually, you know, a flood or um, CO2, and even uh, even CO2 can be mitigated. I don't know how much I want to say publicly on all that, but yeah, you know, yeah. with you have the option of dill flushes, and then you can always go to semi flow circuit where you plug into your bailout gas, and you just continue every few breaths. You 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 uh, flush the the rebreather with fresh gas. Yep. So you're basically taking an aluminum eighty and times four. <laughs> You're, so extending the gas. Yeah. yeah. So you know, there's a lot of options that you can get yourself out of trouble with on a rebreather. That when you know, you look at open circuit is safer, but what do you got? You know, I've yeah. got this much gas, and I've got two of these. Not very many. Not a whole lot know. of options, but yeah, that disclaimer, like you said, is you, you got to know what you're doing to do those things. As oh, long yeah. as you practice and you're educated in those, then then yeah, you could. You've got a lot of tools in your toolbox as long as you know how to use them. Absolutely, so, and practice, practice, practice too. Yep. And as long as you're breathing and fighting, you have a chance. The second you give up, you're done. So when it comes to safety, whether it's open circuit or rebreather diving. As long as you're fighting, as long as you're breathing, you have a chance. The second you go up, it's just not going to work out for me. That's when you're done. Yeah. You know, so safety wise, you just got to fight. Yeah, definitely. All right. So uh, we're a little bit over. I want to get you guys to dinner and whatever you're doing and get you on the road for wherever you're driving to. Um, but uh, thanks a lot for your time, guys. We really appreciate it. We had a, a bunch of people um, popping in and out. Looks like we got 25, 30 people watching it on live. Um, so pretty good turnout for, for this time of day and all that fun stuff. So um, truly appreciate you guys sharing all that. And you're more than welcome to dive with us anytime. I appreciate Excellent. it. Thank you for putting all this together, everything you're doing over the next couple of weeks with series. I know people are going to be going through a lot and stuck at home and everything else. And it's nice to give, you know, divers, you know, actually be able to listen to actual divers, not watch that stupid 47 meters or whatever. You know? Oh so, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, yeah. It, I, it's awesome. <laughs> yeah, thank but, you. Yeah. That's uh, that's gonna be my stipulation for going back and working in the hospital. I have to still be able to do the live series. However, that has to work out. So <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> Nate, anything to add? Excellent. Thank you Nate. very much. Nate, no, I appreciate you taking the time to, to keep everybody entertained. My pleasure. What do you What's have to that? say there, Jeff? Nate, it's the apocalypse. What are you carrying? I got a Glock, Glock 45 at my knee. <laughs> so. <laughs> Too funny. Uh, uh, fight wait, off those zombies. <laughs> uh. <laughs>
Good deal, guys. Well, we, we appreciate, appreciate it. it. Coronavirus didn't make zombies, actually. Yeah, yeah I know. <laughs> right? Yeah, exactly. I was already. I got nothing now. I, uh, it's all over. So, cool, guys. Really appreciate Bye. it. Thank you, guys. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Take care, guys. Thanks. Bye. Yeah. Bye. 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 <clears throat>